Please read in unison our first scripture reading, and it is Hosea 11, 1 through 11. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. The more I called them, <clears throat> the more they went from me. They kept sacrificing to the Baez and offering incense to idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up in my arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with bands of love. I was to them like those who lift infants to their cheeks. I bent down to them and fed them. They shall return to the land of Egypt, and Assyria shall be their king, because they have refused to return to me. The sword rages in their cities. It consumes their oracle priests and devours because of their schemes. My people are bent on turning away from me. To the Most High they call, but he does not raise them up at all. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zebo? My heart recalls within me. My passion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my fierce anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and no mortal, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. They shall go after the Lord, who roars like a lion. When he roars, his children shall come trembling from the west. They shall come trembling like birds from Egypt and like doves from the land of Assyria. And I will return them to their homes, says the Lord. Reading from Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. Jesus told... The disciples pray then in this way. Our Father in heaven, may your name be revered as holy. May your kingdom come, may your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts and we also as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I think we've done this before, but when I coach pastors, I start with the centering time, uh, a little different than how we do it in, in worship. And so I'm, and again, it's all the busyness, and I don't, I don't know, I'm sure that, that we're alike in this, but trying to get the mind to stop spinning and to think about this, that, and everything, and to just focus is quite the challenge at times. So when I'm entering into, I coach other pastors, enter that time, we start with a centering space just to like kind of shrug off that and pause and really enter into this space. So I'm going to lead us in an exercise that I do with, with pastors. So I'm going to invite you to close your eyes and take a deep breath, really fill your lungs and purposely slow your breathing down. And now I want you to imagine that you're standing in a place that gives you peace. A place that just naturally, it makes you just want to breathe it in. It makes you... <sighs> what do you see around you? What are the colors? Pay attention to the details. What do you hear? What do you smell? Are there any sensation on your skin? If, there, if you're outside, is there a breeze? If you're standing on the beach, I invite you to wriggle your toes in the sand or the water. If you're in, a gra in the grass and your shoes are off, feel that sensation under your feet. And again, take a deep breath. And then I usually say a prayer 
with folks and for this morning. I pray, dear Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So we're doing a sermon series on the Lord's Prayer. Last week we focused in on our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And today we're focusing in on thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If I were to ask you to close your eyes and picture yourselves in the kingdom of God, what would that look like? It's kind of tough because there's no real agreement about what the kingdom of God is. Now, I need to stop and note, last week I noted that we need to talk about language, and that comes up again throughout the sermon. Last week we paused, or, and I talked about how Father is a metaphor, that there are lots of, all of our names for God are metaphors. Uh, our language is limited, and so we have this, we have a rich a uh, uh, treasure chest of, of, of metaphors that we can use for God. Father's one of them, and it's a great metaphor for there, there are others. We could, uh, one of them is including mother. And I say that just to balance out the masculine and the feminine. Today we also have the word kingdom. And in modern scholarship, uh, folks are trying to move away from masculine language and so you'll hear them talk about the realm of God or the reign of God or the kingdom of God. And they just take that little G out and the kingdom, kin, family, family of God. That's the one that for me is the, is the easiest, but it's, it's, it's a retraining. But I just wanted to acknowledge that. We are all created in the image of God, male and female, they were created. So is God male? Is God female? Yes, no, both, and miss God is mystery. God is bigger than any box than we can, that we can put God in. I just want to acknowledge that, and now back to the prayer. The kingdom of God, what's it look like? Is it a place? Is it a state of being, a state of our souls? Is it now? Is it the promised future? The answer is purple. No, it's, you know, the answer is E, all of the above. Jesus is speaking when he you know, teaches how to pray. He's talking to disciples. The disciples are Jewish. They would have heard this concept of the kingdom of God as the, the messianic age. The Messiah has arrived and all is right with the world. And in one of my, the resources that I read, it's a New Testament that the commentary is written by Jewish scholars who are there to inform the reader about, about, how, about Jewish customs and also how things would have been received at that time by the listeners. And I read that these, uh, the disciples would have heard the Messianic age would include four things. General resurrection gathering of the exiles, final judgment, and universal peace. But they also note that Jesus seems to partially redefine the kingdom of God as something internal to the individual and available in the present. That is that both and. In Luke, which mentions the kingdom of God more than any of the Gospels, in chapter 17, verse 21, Jesus says that the kingdom of God is among you, but it could also be translated within you. So there's this external reality to the kingdom and an internal reality to the kingdom. And part of my studying this week, I read the history of the understanding of the kingdom of God throughout the ages, from the early church up until present day. So with a very broad brush, the early church was, you know, was preoccupied. They believed that Jesus was coming again. The Messianic age was coming soon. And we see them struggle and wrestle with, where is he? So they had to change their understanding of the kingdom of God being this, it's coming in the future too, but he said it's here now. So what does that mean? 
So we see, that we see them struggle with it in, in Scripture. Later, as the church became more formal, some came to understand that the kingdom of God was the church. The reformers in the Reformation said, uh 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 The kingdom of God is not an organization. Luther, Martin Luther, equated the kingdom of God with divine grace. Calvin in, envisioned a theocratic society. And then the d- debate became whether the kingdom of God is a gift from God, is it all God's work, or something that we achieve with our active participation. And we still debate this today. today. Again, broad brush <laughs> of that history. Practical ac- application. Right before COVID, I was in Cuba. And I heard a, Presby- a Cuban Presbyterian pastor talk about the kingdom of God. And he used the language of utopian society, equating them. And I balked at that language because I'm like, we're Presbyterians. We don't, you know, we, we understand that we're a bunch of goofballs. We understand that we never get it right. Perfect. We're never going to reach perfection. And I sat with a colleague after, after this talk, and I said, you know, that's just, I, I don't use that language when I talk, talk about my faith. I don't, I don't know that I lift up, like, the kingdom of God as, you know, uh, as, you know, as possible. And his reaction to my reaction was visceral. And he said, why not? And I went, ooh. My colleague is, was a, a gay African-American man, pastor, who has had to fight for his rights, who every day experiences prejudice. And I think he heard me saying that, that I'm not lifting up the kingdom of God as something that we're supposed to work towards. And again, language, I have since thought about it, it's... I, you know, I, if I could have that conversation again, I would say, yep, yeah, but I talk about justice. Micah, what do we call, you know, what does the, God, the Lord require of us but to, to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God? I talk about Matthew 25 a lot, where you, what Jesus expects us to be occupied doing while we're here. Feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked, take care of the sick, uh, Visit those who are in prison and welcome the stranger. Talk about that. That's kingdom work. I talk about laying down our lives in service to God. And now I would add, and in service to the kingdom. There's a saying that shows up in my, in my feed every once in a while on Facebook. I think it's from the Talmud, and again, I'm paraphrasing it horribly, but it's when something awful has happened, somebody always posts this, that when you are overwhelmed by the need in the world, it doesn't mean you get to abandon the work. Do what you can where you can, even if it's a little bit. John Wesley, it, he never said this, but it was attributed to him, you know, do all the good you can, wherever you can, with whomever you can, as long as you can, 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 yeah. So yes, being very clear, we are called to work for the kingdom, and it is our work. The Lord's Prayer starts, and we talked about this last week, starts with imperatives, commands. You know, as a reminder, we're saying, our, our Father in the heavens, make your name holy. Bring your kingdom. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Again, imperatives, commands to God. But as citizens of the kingdom... This is our work, too, to give bread, to forgive, to be gracious. We already know through your, our own experience that we get to be part of it. We've been the recipient of it from one another, from other folks. We also get to offer these things to one another. We, we're doing and experiencing kingdom work all the time. We get to be co-conspirators with God, to live as Easter people, 
to love in Jesus' name, gathering those who have been rejected in the past or by society the way that Jesus collected people who have been rejected. To acknowledge God's sovereignty, and that, that's another good word, trying to avoid uh, masculine language, sovereign. To acknowledge God's sovereignty, who is judge over all creation. And to, and to seek to live in peace, internally as well as externally. And by the way, that's those four things that I talked about that are signs of the messianic age. I just said those four things again, just using different language. That's what the Jews expected from the kingdom of God. And that's what we're expected to work for also. Because Jesus redefined the kingdom of God language as something internal to the individual and available in the present. Now again, same same concepts but different words. Resurrection is possible in the here and now. We are called to be witnesses. We have all found new life on the other side of some death in our lives, whether it's the death of a loved one, a death of a relationship, a death of a job, a death of a dream. And we live in that faith that believes in resurrection. We have all sought inclusion and found it in the family of God. And God forgive us when we don't extend that inclusion to other children of God because of our own prejudices, because we're choosing to be judged over God who, again, in the end, is the only judge. And then we have the responsibility, the honor, the joy, the challenge, and the blessing to be, to be bridge builders, to try to create peace in our world. And we're not always going to do it well. But again, there's that message of, and we're going to get there on, on forgiveness and being gracious to one another. And the peace that we seek starts in here, but we pray that it pervades our homes and our streets, and our nation, and our world. We get to be part of that. Same concepts, again, different words. If prayer is an exchange of wishes, and we are saying, God, this is what we wish. God is looking right back, looking right back at us, and yeah, that's my wish too, on earth as it is in heaven. Again, when we think about that, it can be overwhelming. And I am reminded of a frame that I often turn to, or the only reason that I'm a pastor. If God calls us to something, God does not abandon us to do it on our own, but God promises to be with us to make it so. I pray that we all might live in faith and in confidence and in determination to do what we can each and every day to give glory to God and to work for God's kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.